Welcome, everybody. This is the Sakai Virtual Conference uh, Birds of a Feather session on developing great teaching and learning events for faculty. Uh, my name is Martin Ramsey. I've already been chatting to some of the people who have joined in here. I'm the moderator of this session. I'm the managing director of the LAMP Consortium, which is a group of 16 colleges and universities that share a single instance of Sakai. So that makes it a little bit interesting for who we are. Um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping things that I want to talk about, if I may. Um, first, we are clearly, obviously, using Big Blue Button for this session. You've obviously found your way in, uh, but I would suggest that you familiarize yourself with the controls. You can see the audio webcam, audio and webcam icons um, on the screen, uh, in, in the, the screen that I've put on this there for you to look at, as well as in the upper left-hand corner, which is where you actually control them. Um, if you have a microphone, um, I'm encouraging you to use that uh, during our session. It doesn't look like we're going to have a huge number of people. Um, if we have a huge number, then we may have to mute the attendees and just sort of uh, let people talk one at a time. But I'm hoping that we, frankly, don't have to do that because I'm encouraging the, us to just have a good conversation here. Uh, of course, I'd ask you to use good web etiquette. Uh, you know, use a headset to eliminate feedback. Uh, mute your audio unless you're speaking. Um, limit the background noise. Um, I did one of these one time, and I had some folks who were in uh, Cairo, and uh, the street noises from Cairo were quite distracting. I don't know that I heard any camels going by, but you know, you sort of had that picture in your mind. Um, it's, uh, you you can talk, type in your comments in the lower right-hand corner on your screen. That's a good way to do it if you don't have a microphone. And uh, let me just point out that this session is being recorded, and so you'll be able to review it later. And also, I'm going to try to document the suggestions that we come up with. We'll see how that works, but that's going to be basically my my intent. Um, just in terms of a couple of norms, I hope that this is a really lively and interactive session. I um, hope you'll use your microphone if you have it. Otherwise, use chat to join in the conversation. And frankly, our purpose is to share the best ideas we have for developing great teaching and learning events for faculty. I see this as just a big sharing session. You know, Bring your best ideas, share them with other people, and uh, I think it'll be a very helpful session for, for everybody. Um, as a side note, there is a forum topic that Wilma has set up within the Sakai Virtual uh, Conference site. Feel free to post your questions, ideas there. But after the session is complete, it might even be good to upload um, additional documentation and so forth if you have something you're willing to share with the other participants. So I'm hoping that you're, you'll do that as well. So that's, uh, that's all the housekeeping that I've got. Hopefully that's enough just to get going so that we can get started. Uh, but let me just throw it open and say, um, what uh, what ideas do you have? Because this is a big conversation. So uh, tell me, what what do you do in the way of engaging your faculty with great teaching and learning events? I should have had my little cricket sound queued up so that we could play that. No, seriously, you have to talk now. This is this is the interactive part. Okay. Are we all here just to get ideas from other people? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> well, I, I, I feared that this might happen. <laughs> so uh, let me sort of um, put a little bit, I'll, I'll just, I'll throw out my idea. Um, it's, it's a fairly significant one, so I don't want to uh, make anybody go, oh dear, we have to do something like that. But this consortium that I work with has 16 uh, member institutions. And we do a big summer conference every year. We call it LAMP Camp. Um, and it, it, the, the official name is the Pedagogy and Technology Conference. It's the last week in July. Uh, three days open to everybody. If you'd be interested in coming, you know, you, we'd welcome you to come as well. Um, but we try to have a track for people who are new to Sakai because we find that there are often um, faculty who are very, very new to Sakai or distance education. Um, and um, we have tracks for more expert users. Uh, Jill, I'm going to mute your microphone for just a second here. You, um, we, we try to have something for expert users that's more challenging. And then specialty tracks, we're finding that more and more administrators are wanting to learn about Sakai and so forth. And of course, we always have a group of technologists that, that come. So it's kind of a big deal for us, but that's one of the things we do. We hold it on member campuses. Um, we include the lodging and meals. It's basically the whole package. We, frankly, we have lots of fun. Um, it's reasonably priced, 350 US. Um, for those of you who think in terms of pound sterling uh, or euros or whatever. 
Um, and you can see lampschools.org about that one. But I did want to point out this guy right here is Chuck Severance. See, he actually came to our conference, so that was kind of cool. That's Brian Holiday of Longsight. Uh, so we had we have some good folks. So there's one idea. Has anybody tried a sort of a, 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 a some kind of faculty event like this, some kind of conference? Okay. <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> Witten says, no, we mainly have a series of workshops. All right, Witten, can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, what, what kinds of things do you do at your workshop? I see that you don't have your microphone on, so it's going to have to be uh, typing it in, but uh, give it a try. And I'm going to switch over to another screen here and actually try to document what we what we talk about. So go ahead and tell us a little bit if you can, Witten. I'd appreciate it. He's going to type now. And the rest of you have to be thinking in terms of what you do. Um, Rob Keeney says he's the only faculty at his institution. Um, however, however Yes. However, um, we do conduct train the trainer events for. Uh, I'm not sure I would call them faculty, but because I'm not in a academic environment, but we do um, different events that help uh, help people learn how to facilitate, how to present, how to engage their their folks. So I call it train the trainer. And we've yeah. done that in a number of different forums. But, again, we're kind of in a very different environment than probably most of the attendees. And and I know you, Rob, and I think that probably you are, but I, I think that it's really good to have some diversity of, of perspectives. And I know that you bring a different perspective here, so that's good. Let me go back to, to what Witten says. She says we provide a basic tracks workshop. Um, maybe... Um, I don't know if tracks is an acronym, or do you mean tracks as I sort of think of different tracks at a conference? Uh, but could you say a little bit more about that? And since you're typing, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of time. Oh, tracks is your instance of Sakai. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so interpreting that for everybody else, um, basic Sakai workshops for, for mostly new faculty, and then uh, workshops that are tool-specific. So how often do you do that, um, Witten? How do you do that once at the beginning of the year? Tell me a little bit more about that. Okay, I'm just capturing these ideas here. Um, and Jill, Jill has a microphone, so Jill, I'm going to turn your microphone on. You talk a little bit about your groups. Um, yes, okay, hello everyone. I'm from Oxford University in the UK, and our instance of Sakai is called WebLearn. So we have a WebLearn user group which meets three times a year. And we encourage faculty members to talk about what they're doing with Sakai rather than us as the central Sakai team telling them how great Sakai is. Um, and so we have quite a few enthusiasts and champions, and we're going to run a project next year to encourage more faculty members to engage with using Sakai. Very good. Um, let me ask, and this is a question for all of you, um, that have already spoken up, and Sam Leith, thank you for being here. It's good to see you again. Um, I'll, I'll ask you too. Uh, how do you get faculty to to want to come? How do you get them engaged? What's the what's the incentive, if you will? Um, because I have seen a lot of schools say, "Well, what if we give a party and nobody comes?" And, and frankly, that can happen. So, how do you get people engaged, Jill? How do you how do you get people to want to come to this? It's very difficult. That's a good question, Martin. Um, we have our same group of enthusiasts, and it's really difficult to get new people to come along. Uh, we do record the talks that are given at the face-to-face -face meetings, and we make those available in Sakai. So we hope that that encourages people to come along to the next session. 
uh, but we usually only have about 25 people at a time, uh, whereas we have about 250 in the online Sakai site. So uh, that's only 10% to our face-to-face meetings. I'm sorry, I'm struggling with the big blue button text tool. Every time I click out of it, I have to start over again. That's no good. <laughs> oh, me. Sorry about this. I'm going to keep on typing here. Um, didn't spell your name right, sorry. Get it right there. Three time each year Sakai training event. Hard to get people come. And uh, Katie says, that's our constant problem. Parties with no attendance. And let me go back to what San Lee said. There's a South Africa annual conference that runs across institutions. Uh, there's a teaching and learning track at the conference. The Sky South Africa group uh, also has a mailing list. Now, there's an idea. Uh, that's, a, that's a different one. Okay. This is Katie. Yeah, mailing list is one of the things that I think we're going to be trying because essentially all of the offerings that we have, nobody comes. And so the sort of pull options, you know, offer it, see what who comes to us is really not working well for us. And so um, our next attempt is going to be coming up with a series of um, emailed sort of mini modules or, you know, tutorials or even just tip lists, things like that that we're pushing out to people and seeing if that even gets more interest in people asking us questions or anything, just, you know, some engagement from the people who aren't the ones who come back constantly, who we know are hungry and will also look for information on their own is also the problem. You know, the people right. who are interested are interested whether or not we're telling them something. So they'll right. find the information even if we don't don't offer it. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Katie, that's, that's helpful. What about some of the rest of you that we haven't heard from? <laughs> Preaching to the converted, right. <laughs> and Jill, I thought I did detect a little bit of a, I'm interested you're in the UK, but you're South African by descent, so. <laughs> That's we right. We group here. <laughs> <laughs> some of the rest of you weigh in. What, what ways do you use to, to compel them to come in off the street and <laughs> learn at your knee? Uh, let's see, Witten is, let yeah. me just read what Witten said here, a reminder of that. Uh, we have four to six basic workshops at the beginning of the semesters. Then we offer another four to six more basic workshops throughout the semester. For Gradebook 2, we have just two of those workshops at the beginning of the semester and then three to four more throughout the year. Okay, that's good. And then later she says uh, the amount of workshops depend on uh, faculty demand, so we may add or remove two to three sessions per semester. Our other tool-specific workshops are roughly as equivalent as Gradebook 2 workshops. Okay, so you've got quite a bit. And Witten, I'm sorry, you were with which institution? I'm not sure that you said, and I lost track of it. I probably, I'm a, a bad moderator. Texas State. Okay, very good. For y'all that are overseas, that's, that's the big U.S. state that's sort of down south. It's big. <laughs> okay. Um, was, did I cut somebody else off? I thought somebody else was speaking. Hi, yeah, this is Alina from Yale. Um, I, I just wanted to say and echo the same thing a lot of other people said. We've tried doing workshops in the past, but it's, it's difficult to convince faculty that they need to learn anything new. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what I've been doing is a lot more one-on-one -on -one sessions, but I would love to do something, um, that's based on a theme. Um, I'm thinking about a collaboration in teaching and learning workshop coming up in the uh, in January or February. Ah. But there's there's also a, an important point in what you said that you end up it may not be your preference but you end up working one on one. Uh, right? Exactly. And and that I mean I have also seen that 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 it it's probably not our our preference, um, it's, for, it's certainly not the most efficient. Um, instead of meeting you know, 25 people, uh, we're only meeting one person. But on the other hand, sometimes that's the only one that really works, and it's kind of tough. I do workshops with um, administrative assistants uh, for departments who then do one-on-ones with faculty. So I, I also do that kind of thing. But um, in general, it's difficult to get a, a large group of faculty members together in one place. <laughs> 
Has anyone tried, um, I know it's kind of an old idea now, but these sort of brown bag lunch ideas, you know, even if you spring for, for pizza or whatever, you know, we'll feed you if you will come. Does that help any, or have we sort of passed? It works with students, but I don't know that it works with faculty. Okay. Katie's saying the same thing, one-on-one's been her solution. Let me go back to an earlier point that's been raised by at least two people. Rob's raising it, and, and it was also raised earlier. Um, this this idea that people don't have anything to learn. Uh, Alina says that. Um, sorry, Alina, I misspelled your name. I'm going to get that fixed. Oh, dear. Now I've... <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> I'm really botching this. Sorry. <laughs> oh, my. Okay. Um, text. We're going to do it. This is going to be strange. Um, the, the, the idea of they don't have anything new to learn. Is there a solution to that? Is there a way? I'll, I'll tell a story here. My grandmother used to say the old saying that at least we have in the U.S., you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. That's an old saying that we have around here. And, you know, it, it probably applies pretty well to faculty. You can lead them to the Sakai knowledge, but you can't stick their head in the water and force them to drink. But my grandmother used to also say this. She would say, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you sure can put salt in their oats. And I think that's kind of a maybe a useful concept here. The question is, how can you salt the oats for faculty? How can you uh, give them a thirst for what you're hopefully wanting them to learn? And I throw that out there as to uh, to an idea of, oh, Jill says we offer tea and scones. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I'd, uh, I'm up for that. <laughs> Um, but but be thinking about that. How can you put salt in their oats? How can you uh, make them, you know, give them a thirst for what you're offering, uh, make them want to come? Let me look what Sam Lee is saying here. Our department has a number of workshops that we run, uh, we've run historically, and usually have a good turnout. Um, and he's got a, a URL there, which is worth checking out. Uh, not all of these are Sakai. Um, our Sakai instance is called Vula. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, we advertise these via e yeah, mailing lists, and most of the sessions are also recorded. Next year, we're discussing separating Sakai and Vula administrative training from the more academic teaching uses of Vula. Okay, that's that's so interesting. You're finding that separating the academic and the more administrative um, is perhaps going to be helpful. Good. What about the question of putting salt in faculty's oats? What are some ways that you get them uh, wanting to come, other than tea and scones, which is good? <laughs> <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> I'd come for that. This is Katie again. Um, I work at Antioch University too, uh, by oh, the way. Thanks. Okay. Um, and I happen to be in in uh, California, but we have campuses all over the country. Five five campuses. Um, I would say that the 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 thing that I do that gets the biggest reaction in general is showing other people's work that's better than the person I'm working with. I mean, just to put it bluntly, um, <laughs> if they see examples of something that somebody else is doing that's still attainable, um, that's all. But that's a fine line to walk too. So I find that a lot of the times I need to be able to gauge the technical abilities of the person before I show them something. Because if I show them something that's just out of reach, then it's just frustrating and they'll never come back again. And that's, that's so it's easy to say, oh, just show some examples, um, I think, as a general idea. But I think it's more nuanced than that when you're actually trying to have long-term um, engagement with faculty, at least in my experience. I think that's... Uh... That's lovely. That's that makes that makes great sense. I, I too have found that. Um, in fact, one of the uh, this this is maybe a, this is not under the heading of uh, developing great teaching and learning events for faculty. But one of the ways that I found that works the best to get faculty using Sakai is frankly peer pressure. Um, and often the peer pressure comes from students. Dr. Smith, how come you don't have your grade book in Sakai? Dr. Jones does. And you know, in a couple of years, that takes that has effect that works um, so yeah anyway uh, th that's that's very helpful thanks Katie for for giving that I think it's it's very true that um, the work has to be a stretch but within reach you know something that could be attainable uh, because I, I work with a lot of very small schools who don't have very big budgets and so some of the sometimes they go to conferences and see these huge elaborate projects that they just frankly couldn't afford no matter what, um, and they just come away sort of discouraged. So I can certainly relate to that. Very good. 
Okay, what else? We're looking for good ideas here. And I'm sorry that the screen is so messy. I've, I've attempted to, every time I click away, I have to start over again. And so I thought I could be over the top of it, but I can't. So I'm doing my best. <laughs> Let me ask you to think outside the box a little bit. We've talked about events um, in their sort of typical uh, implementation, uh, which would either be sort of a training event on campus, uh, as Witten did a good job of ex describing what they're doing, um, and I think that's really good, um, or sort of a, a conference style thing like Sam Lee was talking about. Uh, what are some other ways? that we could actually reach faculty that may, may be in sort of an, a non-traditional delivery mechanism. I mean, after all, we work in educational institutions. We should be able to figure this out if anybody can, right? Oh. Katie says they do an online course that runs during the term that they're teaching. We get moderate response to that. Could you say a little bit more about that, Katie? You've got a microphone. Speak up. Yeah, sure. Um, so we just started doing this uh, the end of last year, and I think we've done three sessions of it. And we have an online course that faculty enroll in. And they it happens while they're actually teaching. And so, um, you know, at the very beginning, you know, we'll talk about making sure that they're including good. Well, well, actually, we try to have it start right before they start teaching, but it runs overlapping with when they're actually teaching. So, you know, at the beginning, we talk about making sure they have all the elements in their syllabus and that they're giving good instructions early on to the students and, you know, remembering that if they were in the classroom and they would point to something that they need to actually state that in text somewhere in their class, you know, those kinds of, you know, just basic translations to online environments. Um, but then during the class, they can ask questions about things that are going wrong. I mean, it ends up being essentially just a platform of another group of faculty that they feel at ease talking to because they're in a class with them. Um, and the, we found that the work in terms of doing assignments and participating in the readings drops off pretty dramatically as the course moves on and they're teaching, which is eh, fair enough. But um, they did continue to use the forums and ask questions of each other. So um, it worked well to give um, people are interested in it and the concept of it, whether or not they actually complete the work. But it seemed like it did work fairly well to build smaller communities of faculty that wouldn't otherwise um, have had a place to ask questions of or, or bounce ideas off of. Katie, do you find that um, you really can build a community, I'll use that word, um, uh, of, of sort of learners who persist perhaps even beyond the end of the term? They've, they've gone through this online class together. Maybe there's been a fairly significant drop off, but still yet they know the names of their cohort, I, I would hope. Um, mm -hmm. So if, if they were to bump into a member of their cohort a, a year later, would, they, would that experience, that shared experience actually be meaningful so that they might uh, feel comfortable sort of saying, how are you doing this and I've got an idea about that kind of thing? I'm not sure yet. Um, I, I'm assuming that's the case for some of the people, the ones who are a little bit more engaged. I'm sure it's not true for everybody in there. But um, I have had people... Um, mentioned to me if I'm talking about what somebody else is doing and it was somebody who was in a class with someone else. Um, they've never met, you know, one of them's in New England and one of them's in Seattle, you know, but they'll say, oh, that's that person who said, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I know that some of it's sinking in for some people. And I figure any of that is better than none of it because I think that, um, you know, right now the people who are doing something feel pretty isolated. Right. Okay. Is that true for the rest of you? Uh, let's use the hand raise tool on this. Do you think your faculty feel kind of isolated in their use of Sakai? Raise your hand if that's true uh, for your, f and, and by the way, the hand raise tool is in the lower left hand corner of your screen. Um, yep, I'm seeing some hands go up. Okay, that's good. Uh, but not a lot. That's interesting. Okay, so, so some of you who didn't raise your hand, who say that uh, your faculty don't feel necessarily isolated, um, how how do you think you get around that? Uh, 
I'm looking at some people that we haven't heard from yet. Oh, boy. Okay. Well, I'll tell you one of the takeaways I'm taking from this, and that is that I want more people to have microphones so we can all talk. <laughs> well, let's go back to some of the... Go ahead, please. Oh, I was going to say, I just wanted to say that I'm finding it kind of comforting that nobody has amazing solutions to this, <laughs> and that I'm not the only one with these problems. So, you know, if nothing else... I'm taking that away from myself personally. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad we could be of help. <laughs> um, I, I suppose, in a way, that's why we started doing. Uh, maybe I should give a little bit of a history of this um, Sakai conference that we do in the summer. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we had uh, we had started out. This would be back in 2006. So it goes that far back. Um, in 2006, we we did, we knew that we had to do some very fundamental workshops with faculty because nobody knew how to do this stuff. You know, it was very very new. And so the initial what what became the conference was was really a a week long intensive. This is how you use Sakai kind of thing with very very nuts and bolts kind of stuff. Um, although I will say that um, my colleague and I who were doing it, we had been teaching WebCT before that. And we switched to Sakai for cost reasons, frankly. Um, and the the first day was devoted to navigation. Uh, we spent an entire day on how do you navigate through this. And when when we switched to Sakai and we uh, you know thought, well, we'll just use the same curriculum. We'll talk about navigation on day one. And by 10 o'clock uh, on on Monday morning, we were done with navigation. And we kind of oh crap, what do we do now? Uh, because uh, the the navigation in Sakai was so much easier than WebCT. So that was kind of an interesting. Uh, <laughs> Aside there, but that that workshop that started out being you know very intentional sort of morphed into this conference with lots more offerings. The first year we offered tracks, you know, more than one track at the same time was uh, probably four years ago, maybe five years ago, um, and you know those have been expanding so that I'm sure I think that next year in 2015 when we do our workshop we'll have even more tracks. I mean it's just kind of growing organically as to as to what people need, but uh, we we have really uh, tried to make it fun. Uh, like I said, we go out to dinner. Um, we do some outdoor activities, which people, some people hate, but you know, hey, it's it's a it's a way to sort of engage people. Uh, we try to really you know draw them in, and it seems to be working because our conference seems to continue to grow. Let me see what Aubrey says here. What types of topics do you include in your professional development? How's it organized? Do you hold your meetings face to face or via Sakai? Okay, there you go, folks. Lots of questions there. Let's take them one at a time. Um, what kinds of topics do you include in your professional development? Well, we have a nice list from from Witten of of what kinds of things she includes. What about the rest of you? Is it is it tool based? Um, why don't you just type in quickly? Uh, do you do tool based work or do you do um, some more broadly pedagogical work? Um, what's going on there? What kinds of things do you do? Ah. I'm reading what Jill has typed here. At Oxford, there are administrators who put up materials for academics. In other words, I assume that they're sort of either course designers or maybe uh, course implementers. Uh, so faculty members have come to expect that, that and they don't engage themselves very much. Um, plus, they see their students face-to-face -face in very small tutor groups, um, as those of us who are in the US and enjoy British television see so often. Uh, so they don't really see the need for technology-enhanced learning, uh, and that makes it difficult. And I, I feel your pain, Jill. That's, yeah, that's that's very much uh, the the challenge, isn't it? That's right. So let's let let's do get a list quick quickly, if we could, of of what kinds of topics you include. Um, Sakai badging to encourage more building and recognition of skills. Uh, there you go. There's an interesting idea, Sam Lee. Um, are, uh, how can I say this? Are faculty susceptible to the badging uh, <laughs> idea? I, I've <laughs> yeah. There you go. Okay. Here's a here's a specific question. Um, are you using badging at all? Yeah, worth a try. Okay. 
So let's okay. Let's talk about this badging idea for a minute. This is kind of interesting. Um, yeah, I'm going to give one end of the spectrum and then basically try to go to the other end. One end of the spectrum is, uh, you know, the the teenage, usually male, uh, playing a video game who is trying to achieve nothing more than that next level in the video game that they're playing. That basically says you're now a master or a super master or whatever the levels are. Um, and you know, when I say, so what can you do with that? Nothing. You know, it's just, but, and yet, it, it's motivating. It's hugely motivating. Um, so uh, does that kind of thinking, does that work with grown-ups, academic grown-ups who are way above that sort of thing? Um, or do, do I find myself, and I, there's, a, there's an app, I'll go ahead and confess on myself here, there's an app that's on my phone uh, called Gas Buddy, that tells you the price of gas um, wherever you happen to be, so you can find the cheapest gas, petrol for you folks across the waves there. Um, and they've started badging, and I noticed that you know if I report on the price of gas in more locations, I get more badges, and I find myself going, ooh, I want to get that badge. <laughs> of course, it doesn't do a thing for me, but I still want it. Uh, so perhaps there is some human motivation involved in badging that we can leverage with faculty. So. I've been controversial. What do you all think about that? Somebody weigh in. <laughs> yeah, a bit more professionally? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, some kind of incentive that staff could put on their CV. Okay, that makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, but what kind of what kind of uh, what would they be able to put on their CV? What would that look like? Um, I had a actually a, a former student. Uh, who's now teaching school, and she said she's interested in getting into project management. And frankly, I think she'd be an outstanding project manager. And she said, but some people want a project management certificate. And I said, well, who's offering their certificate? And it turns out there's dozens, if not hundreds, of places that are offering certificates. So I said, well, do you want me to write you up a quick certificate so you'll have one? <laughs> she said, sure. <laughs> so it's got to have a little more teeth than that, I think. <laughs> Remember when my mother joined Facebook, says Witten, I'm sure instructors would be into badging. Ha ha, there you go, okay. Um, yeah, what would you, what would you, how, what would that badging look like on their CVs? That, that's, that's a really good question, Sam Lee, I like that one. That makes me think about it. And by the way, there is a, there is a badging project, as you see the link that Sam Lee has put in there. Longside is working on a, a badging project. Um, I don't know the status of it, I can't, uh, couldn't tell you where it stands right now, but it's, I know there's been some conversation about about badging and that sort of thing. All right, I need to hear from some other folks, or even folks that I've heard from before. Rob, let me pick on you a little bit and go back to one one of the early things that you said. Um, your train the trainer events. You said um, that folks learn how to facilitate, how to present, how to engage their folks. Um, what what's your curriculum look like? What what kinds of things do you cover when you do that sort of thing? Because I think that's, I mean, we may not think of that as pedagogical, and yet I think it it's fabulously pedagogical. Well, it's, it's very much. Uh, and by the way, that's become a a funny word around around my office. I've been using the word pedagogy and pedagogical and they all think I'm swearing so yeah. uh, <laughs> I've, I've caught some heat over that but in, in any case uh, we talk about most of the people I deal with are sales professionals or sales management professionals and many of them have not been trained or have learned how adults learn and they certainly haven't learned the tools of the trade from a academic standpoint and so they can benefit a lot by learning how to use, I mean, something as simple as, as PowerPoint. We see PowerPoint used in the business environment uh, very poorly to the point where I, I, I detest the tool myself and won't use it, but it's out there. So um, I train them on some very core concepts of, you know, start with the objective. What do you, what is it that you want your audience to know or know how to do, and then everything that you then talk about is driven from that objective. Now, for professional, um, for people that 
that teach for a living, they know that already, and they take it for granted. Uh, hang on, Rob. I don't think that's necessarily true, and I'm wondering what people on the call think about this. Um, how many professors have I seen who are incredibly expert in their area of expertise, physics, biochemistry, uh, humanities, whatever it might be, and yet they have no clue how to teach? Um, maybe I'm overstating it, but I don't think that your, uh, your experience, Rob, is that different from an academic campus. I'm sorry to say. Well, maybe, uh, not, maybe it's not. Who yeah, I would also agree. It's Katie again. I I'll totally agree with that. I think that that's one of our um, main issues with the nothing, you know, I don't need to learn anything, is that these people are so expert in their areas of knowledge that they just can't conceive that they don't understand how to communicate that knowledge to somebody else well. It's a, it's a pretty significant issue, I think. Mm. So, actually, Rob, we may have something to learn from you. Mm. So, it, okay. I guess it's not it's not just us. So, well, and I, as I guess I think back on my college years, which was back in the dark ages when we were still writing with stone tablets, um, <laughs> we had some pretty bad professors who were great subject matter experts, SMEs, but couldn't communicate, couldn't teach because they didn't understand how to communicate um, concepts. To, so to be curious about it, when you have a, a faculty member who says, "Well, I read my lecture notes. What's the matter with kids these days?" Right. You know you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go back to Witten's question. Certification of some sort. Sakai certified educator. I like the ring of that. Is that something that uh, that the Sakai community ought to sort of begin thinking about doing? That could be very very interesting. That's uh, that's a Okay, there we go. Jill says, yeah. <laughs> and I'll probably have to make a, a trip over to see you, Jill, to talk about it, probably. <laughs> no, it's not sorry. It's like, yes. <laughs> right, yeah, okay. Um, this just occurs to me. We did something in our consortium um, that, uh, that, that might go along those lines. It's, well, it's, I guess it's a little different. Let me get my notes here about that. Um, I tell you what, I mean, you're making me think that we ought to, uh, we ought to think about this a little bit. It's a kind certified educator. I like the, the ring of that and, you know, what would it take and so forth. I, you know, I'll, I know some people that we might be able to begin sort of thinking about that. Second thing is, I'm just, it just struck me that, uh, let me put it in here, uh, I think that's right. Let me. I better check my URL. Make sure I've got the right URL here. Hang on, just a second. Sorry, folks. Oh, that's a good thing I did. Oh dear. Okay, I'm gonna have to come up with it. We. One of the things that we did was we felt like there was not a good way for for instructor types to just easily talk to each other um, in sort of non-technical ways. Uh, the Sakai community has these um, uh, great um, venues for, for talking technical talk, uh, but it leaves most of the, the, the faculty world kind of going, what are they talking about? I don't even understand it. So we, we put together a Sakai forum, um, and I'm looking for the URL here. I should have had it bookmarked already. I apologize for this. Nope, that's not it. Uh, Well, I'll have to find it and send it to you. But but the idea was that you could join in this forum uh, to discuss things, and it would be a, 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 an easy way to, ah, it's called Sakai User. Found it. Okay. I was mistyping it. So just a minute here. I'll put it in the, in the chat here. And the idea is that it, it focuses on people who actually use Sakai um, as a way to let them sort of... Um, uh, ask questions of each other, build a knowledge base, uh, search the previous posts that have been made, and so forth, but very much from a non-technical slant, much more of a user slant. Um, so it, you, that's free, and you're welcome to use it. Um, it's, we set it up for our own consortium, but uh, there's no reason that people outside of, of, of our consortium couldn't be using it as well. So um, I encourage you to, to take a look at that. Um, Martin, let me go back. Question. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. Um, a question to the group. Um, one of the things that I would find valuable is looking at 
the work of others to see how others are using Sakai. Um, we've had a little bit of that in, within our own consortium, but I'm wondering how do we create a mechanism so that others throughout the Sakai community could see some of my work and comment on it and say, well, it could use more of this or that, or it's really good here, but it's weak here. And then likewise, having me look at others' work and be able to comment on it. Um, how it, is that desirable, number one? And number two, how would we make that work? What do you all think? I think that would be great. <laughs> uh, one, one of the issues that we have even within our own institution of sharing stuff is coming up against FERPA problems with um, showing mm -hmm. sites that are used rather than just the sort of empty shell mm -hmm. of a site, which is only useful to a point and showing, you know, like good interactions, engagement and in forums and things like that is where we was where we have um, problems. I mean, seeing something would be better than nothing. Absolutely, though. I would love to see what other people are doing and how they're structuring sites. But I wish there were a good way to anonymize, <laughs> for lack of a better yeah. word, um, mm -hmm. the, the things in, in Sakai so that we could show how students are actually engaging with things in very different ways to encourage better, um, better use of the system. That's true. FERPA, and for those of you who are not in the U.S., uh, FERPA is our uh, basically privacy laws that, that affect uh, colleges and universities and that we can't just willy-nilly share information about students and what grades they got and so forth. We have to be, uh, frankly, very careful about that sort of thing. Um, but it, it does put a bucket of cold water on what Rob's talking about here. You'd, you'd like to be able to share, you know, here, here's my class. This is what kids are saying. This is how students are engaging. Um, but Katie's right. We probably dare not do that. So how could we work around that? That's that's a challenge. Got any answers, Katie? Go ahead, Rob. No, I don't have any. You know, it's not an issue for me because no, I'm especially the What's the matter with you people? <laughs> but in the academic world, it's probably a really big deal. But um, you know, my my challenge is coming from a classroom. You know, where I'm. You know, based on the feedback I get, I, I know I'm pretty darn good in the classroom. Um, but when it comes to designing and managing an online course, um, you know, I don't know what I don't. I don't know what I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going back to something that was said earlier: the online course, uh, where you you basically create a, a course for instructors and hope that that they will join in and they sort of drop off. I think that was you, Katie. Um, is is a course like that um, outside of FERPA restrictions? I don't know the answer to that. In other words, could you use something where you're not using real students, but you're using sort of faculty as students? Because it would ah. it almost be more compelling to me that well they didn't engage um, in this and they's you. So how can we do that better? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Katie. No, I was just going to say, yeah, that was me, and that's a, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I would assume not because they are not enrolled students; they're employees, right. and that's a totally different category of person. Mm hmm. 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 Things that make you go. Okay, well, there you go. Well, and if that was part of the agreement to, you know, when you sign up for that course, one of the disclosures is this is a course that is viewable by, you know, whoever around the world. So watch what you say. Um, this isn't a private. Anyway, you could do that in your disclosure, I would imagine. Yeah, like a MOOC, says Katie. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I mean, um, when, when we call in to a, a support desk, we often get a recorded message that says, this call is being recorded and may be used for training purposes. Well, how about a similar kind of disclosure on, you know, this course is being used is you know is is being shared and used for training purposes. I don't know. It's just a thought. I'm looking at the clock, folks. Uh, this is the the discussion is starting to get lively, and I think that uh, the fact that we're all over the world, while while very intriguing and and a lot of fun, I'm I'm delighted to have so many uh, different continents represented in this call. Um, on the other hand, I think if we were face to face, uh, maybe over at, uh, at Jill's house, having that glass of wine that she's having. Um, we'd probably be even more uh, laid back and, and sharing a lot more than we are. I think that's perhaps part of the challenge here. 
so I'm, I'm reflecting on myself here a little bit. Uh, moderating one of these turned out to be a little more challenging than I thought it might have been. Um, and, and I really appreciate those of you who did speak up uh, and, and had microphones and were able to talk. I think that, that added to the discussion quite a bit. Um, but it is time for me to wrap up and let you think about moving on to your next session at the Sakai Virtual Conference. Uh, <laughs> Rob says it's 5 p.m. somewhere in the world, <laughs> and I think it's probably a little little later than that in Great Britain, but uh, still yet. <laughs> um, thanks for the the good conversation. I'm going to actually uh, copy the the chat here, and I apologize for the uh, the, the poor quality of the. Uh, the typing that I did, I, I, I ran into a little technical glitch that I hadn't really anticipated uh, having to do with when as soon as I clicked out of a box, I had to sort of start over. So that, could, that was kind of a, a bit of a problem. But um, still yet, uh, I think it's been a lively conversation, good conversation, and I'm, I'm really glad that you came. Hope you got something out of it. Uh, maybe it was a little bit uh, more challenging than we thought it might be. But uh, I'll, I'll let you go at that and say thank you so much for coming. And Hope to see you again in the real world. Uh, Jill, next time I'm in the UK, I'll look you up. <laughs> so thanks, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.